Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Nola Simon. I'm the host of the Hybrid Remote Center of Excellence. And joining me today is uh, Nicholas Badminton. He is a chief futurist. You've been working in futures for what, 30 odd years? Yeah, I've been uh, I've been sort of in in the professional context since uh, 1996, um, and really there's been there's been a thread of futures through all of that. I mean, at the beginning it was so so to go back a little bit further. 1993 did a did a degree in applied psychology computing, focused on artificial intelligence, linguistics, organizational change. It's very funny that those three things were what I what I looked at, considering where we are today with the craziness of Chat GPT <laughs> and what people are talking about. Um, um, but basically spent my entire career working in data and building out uh, software solutions, running large teams. And there was always a focus, but that was more like five five to ten years. And in the last sort of ten years, there's been a, a direct focus on, on futures work. So, you know, the intersection of humanity, technology, social change, culture, and a whole number of different things. So so that that's where I stand today. But yeah, there's always been a thread of futures all the way from from very early childhood, actually, when I when I started to read, you know, books about, you know, futures thinking and, and speculations on technology. Yeah, cool. Now you on this podcast, you own the very uh, nice distinction, and I'm going to hold it up so people yeah. can see, uh, Facing Our Futures. Nick is the first person to actually send me a copy of his book in advance so I could read it. There you go. <laughs> There you so go. I, I, yeah, I'd like to a video version of this podcast so we yeah. can get his money's worth. And oh, um, I wanted to say thank you. It was a very oh, interesting book. Thank I'm you. fascinated with your approach to storytelling because to me, a lot of this is about challenging worldviews and mindset. And the right. way that we can do that a lot is storytelling. So could you speak to that? It, it's interesting. You know, a lot of uh, leaders, executives, venture capitalists government folks like to talk about the future um but not not many of them actually want to invest in in creating something that actually pr provides a, a, a longevity to any particular you know way of working or mindset or whatever so so you know i i sort of bring new thinking to the situation where it's like okay we got to wake up there's a poverty of imagination in the world. So we, we, we've kind of been put in boxes. And I think uh, in the last you know, 270, 300 years, the Industrial Revolution has sort of beaten that curiosity, that that imagination out of the majority of people. We end up getting getting to work and we're told what to do. Or even if we're sort of top of the tree and we're being creative and strategic, it, it's within boundaries and within boxes. And what we do in Futures Work is, is we sort of, the first thing we do is work out where those boundaries are and we step over them very firmly and then go exploring into a lot of different areas. And and a big part of that is understanding that, you know, we have to ignite imagination. We have to think differently. We have to really admire and embrace a lot of different worldviews. The, the fact is there is no singular future. There's multitude of futures. That's an important part of the mindset. I talk about shifting mindsets from what is to what if. So what if is an invitation to be curious. I mean, back in the day, I used to do keynotes and it was like, you know, this this trend, that trend, this tech and whatever, you know, welcome to the future, you know, and, and this is going to change your life. It's not that simple. And also, that's a very provocative way of, of delivering that information. But, you know, what we have to do is become highly introspective when we start this journey. And when I work with clients, it's like, okay, let, brass tax is, is this. And I sort of talk about this a little bit in the book. And uh, so we get to question our own history. I always say that nostalgia is the enemy of good future thinking. You know the good old days. Let's let's kill that idea immediately. Uh, <laughs> 2019 yeah. was not coming back. Let's yeah, and it's like, oh, do you remember? You know, or, or or granddaddy and daddy built this business, and you know, I've got some examples of where I've had conversations around this. Practice curiosity and be courageous. And being courageous and having bravery with these conversations is really important because. You know, we we've got to we got to speak truth to power, even within our own organisations. I love people like Greta Thunberg getting on stage and saying, you know, blah blah blah. No one's saying anything. That no one's saying anything that's going to be acted upon. This is this this is all not really happening. Um, the amount of people that hate 
Greta Thunberg that I've met because like she she's irritating to them and good we are irritants like you know futurism is activism that's really important what we have to do as well is we have to really get uh comfortable with ambiguity and multiple perspectives because futures is plural there can be lots of different outcomes of lots of different situations this is kind of tricky to work through with clients but ultimately you know when you do exercises in a room of like 30 40 people you end up with dozens and dozens and dozens of potential outcomes potential sort of journeys forward for for the company and they're like well you know what do we do with this it's like you explore them you embrace them you understand that you know lots of people are different i used to work in advertising and i remember i worked for a very large canadian telecommunications company i was I was a, a strategist of, on the agency side working for them. And they said, you know, our ideal client, our ideal customer is, you know, the wife and the husband and the daughter and the son. It was homogenous. It was boring. It was uninteresting. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, we're selling, you know, cable TV to these people. And it's like, Christ, like we're so far away from a reality that, you know, this is this is like the death of imagination and the death of uh, of good thinking anyway. And this brings me on to the next point. You know, once you've actually framed the idea of there being multiple perspectives and multiple futures, we actually have to be creative. And we have to be what I say is uh, wildly creative. We have to entertain as many ideas as possible. And we don't discount anything. And there's no such thing as a, a bad idea. But in doing so, we also need to focus on the non zero sum game. There doesn't there don't have to be winners and losers. <laughs> and this is this is hard for a lot of companies to understand. You know, the best companies in the world don't try and 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 own you exclusively. They 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 like you to be part of a wider ecosystem. They respect that in your life. And some of the big tech companies understand that. You know, whilst you might have someone like Amazon that wants you to only shop at Amazon, they know that the the overall ecosystem of of retail and choice and you being a business person as well as an individual shopper is incredibly. Um, important for that rich tapestry and it's the same for big tech companies social media companies and whatever even though they they all try and ensnare you in their terms and conditions as well so i mean that's some of the the ways to help shift mindsets but again i talk about shifting from what is to what if at a very simple level invitation to be curious and invitation to entertain different possibilities as we look forward and before this podcast started, you posted something on LinkedIn. That's what I was checking earlier. Yeah. Um, you do actually work in themes when you're when you're looking at these these stories and imagination and, and yeah. getting people to look at different things differently. And those themes are geopolitics, perma crisis, simulation, utopia, and long termism. Sure. And so so that was a particular keynote I did with a long time collaborator in Vancouver. I used to live in Vancouver. I now live in Toronto and I sort of travel the world doing what I do. Um, a guy called Greg Spivak from Reboot Communications in Victoria, British Columbia. And, and uh, that was at the Va at Vancouver International uh, Privacy Security Summit. So that was a specific keynote. But, you know, I do talk about the big they're, they're more like mega trends, all of these things. So the the idea that geopolitics and climate change, water, energy, food, uh, resiliency, waste, uh, the circular economy, sustainability, uh, these are all things that I really work uh, with to start with. You know, I don't like to j leapfrog over them and say, oh, right, okay, here's some cool tech. Let's plug that in, metaverse <laughs> metaverse this and GPT-4 that and, and whatever, right? So, and I'm not saying that I've, I've, I've not done that in the past, but these days it's like there are bigger problems to deal with. The dynamics of the world are, are, are around, you know, where the shifting population ec economic growth, uh, where the dynamics of, you know who's good, who are the power brokers and who are the heavyweights behind them sort of trying to enforce enforce things as well so the keynotes that i do these days are a lot lot heavier than they were back in the day when it might be to a marketing and advertising conference it's like here's 10 technologies that are going to change your industry well things are right back down to grassroots so um so thematically i i deal with a number of things what i do every single keynote i do is actually custom so for that particular one, ideas around challenging the idea of utopia, challenging the idea of long-termism, which is the idea of painting a picture of a world 
it's fantastical but we're never going to achieve and uh just before we we started the podcast you said oh i saw you posted something about moonshots of bullshit you know <laughs> uh, and, and and it's interesting that was from uh something that i did about five years ago when i realized that you know we're being fed all of this pr and marketing about the future right singular whereas we need to shirk that off and get real about doing things and unfortunately we're seeing all of Silicon Valley regressing and literally getting rid of all of their capabilities around deep R&D, around proper futures thinking. So, um, yeah, now's the time where there's a little bit of a a bell for the hearts and minds. And, and now's the time for, you know, foresight practitioners to step up and work with people to say, hey, there's a real opportunity here, not only from a profit perspective and a growth perspective, but from a doing the right thing in the world and planning for 10, 20, 30, 50 plus years into our futures. So that's a great question. So if you're a foresight practitioner, how do you mm. find the clients that are actually going to have the openness, that mindset and the willingness to really shift and adapt to that? So this is what I do. And I can't say that this is the same for everyone. I mean, I run a very agile, small organization. I've got an associate uh, group of futurists that I work with. So these are people that know everything from uh, renewable energy to artificial intelligence to urban planning and architecture, a whole you know, military, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and when, when a client comes to us, we can build a team and we can go in and work with them or we can go and do keynotes individually and whatever. But what happens is without fail and without fail in the past 10 years, absolutely all the clients come and find us and they, they come to me directly to say, hey, we want to work with you. And that's a good qualification. Um, I don't want to be part of RFPs. Uh, I don't want to compete. You know, the only way that I compete against people like McKinsey and whoever is just by taking the work before it even comes to their desk. Right. Uh, and, and, and that's really important and bringing rigor. I come from a big, a big a consultancy background, come from an advertising background, come from a technology background. So I can slug it out with the best of them. But then there's the qualification and it's like, okay, do you want to explore? Do you want to change? Do you want to do something? And most recently I was approached to work with a fossil fuel company uh, providing natural gas. And I said, you know, in like 20 30 years your business is going to be obsolete in its current form so why don't we do work together why don't we why don't we imagine a world where what you do today is non-existent in 30 years time and what you're going to be like and you know that was a big pitch <laughs> and the person <laughs> the person i pitched it to you know um in person was like you know oh, you know yeah you know we need to do some thinking but clearly uncomfortable because they're still trying to protect their own business even though the cracks are starting to to show and took it back to the ceo and senior executives and they're like no we 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 just we just want to focus on our current plans and and this is the problem right that company is likely not going to exist in 30 years time or in like 15 years time they're going to scramble very hard to to make up ground that they they could have started establishing today right so it, it's kind of interesting you know, I, I i've done work with governments i've done work with with large tech companies i've done works with with startups startups make changes really quick i at the beginning of uh covid I, I worked with a startup out of Halifax and I was working with the CEO and we went in, we did some exercises, I actually prototyped a lot of the, uh, the exercises and workshops and some of the, the ideas that I shared in my book with, with that on that particular engagement. And um, following that, they, they looked at their company, they looked at their vision and their brand. They looked at, you know, their roadmap and they changed everything. And they were still fundamental about what they were delivering as a product and a service. It was a technology platform, but the way that it was done and the people on the board of advisors and the, the, the makeup of the team and content and promise and everything changed. And the business just like is booming today. And it's really interesting. I worked with one of the world's largest tech companies, again, at the beginning of, of uh, the pandemic. And yeah, they, they made policy decisions to protect people that were working alone <laughs> at home uh, remotely um, because of the signals that were very clear coming out in the world of 
you know, the the challenges that people have from a mental health perspective and the dynamics of remote work and how challenging that is and whatever. So, you know, there's there's lots of things that can be done. I mean, typically we find that there's a champion within these organizations. And if you have that champion and they're senior enough, we can really start to inject new thoughts on how the world might be. Cool. And that's actually what you did when the pandemic started. You sh- you lost all your speaking opportunities and you pivoted yeah. to talking about the future of work and examining that, right? Yeah. At the end of 2019, I like career was was going incredibly well. You know, 3,000 people in the Bellagio in Las Vegas, even in like January 2020, you know, Des Moines, Iowa you know 2000 people um like from inland investment and 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 farming uh anthony scaramucci was there like the, the famed uh, <laughs> press guy for trump for 10 days but he runs the salt <laughs> conference i was invited to the salt conference everything was going to everything was going to be like literally ignited and it all disappeared uh, i bought a house my my partner was pregnant and i moved in and i lost all my work um but what do you do did we see it coming I don't think I actually saw it coming as ferociously as it did. But what do you do? You do you you sit down, you do good futures work and you and you hunker down, you work out what you need to do, you transform your business, and then you do the work. And right. I did some really interesting work, work with the Bank of Canada, big tech companies, small tech companies, farming companies. 2021 was the biggest year I ever had. And, and I didn't, you know, I, I didn't do any engagement outside of the studio that I built at home. <laughs> so it's right. interesting now i'm back on the road there's pretty much almost no virtual keynotes this year but it's interesting now we now we're facing a recession right. so we're having a different kind of work happening today as well and it, it, it's really fascinating i mean you know there, there's no such thing as tumultuous times to uh to make it a good condition on which to hire a futurist Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's what you mean by perma crisis, right? Because there's constantly something happening. Yeah. How do you constantly adapt? And that's actually part like that's, that's underlying the mental health issue is just, you know, people are having to adapt to that constant ambiguity, constant change. um, And they just quite don't quite know where to go. And there's resistance. Yeah. And we've ignored a lot of things. So I talk about black elephants in in, in the book. You know, the the idea, everyone says black swans and they they get it completely wrong. A black swan event is an unknown unknown. It's going to be a tsunami. It's going to be a meteorite. It's going to be an earthquake, something like that. A black elephant is that thing that's always been stood in the room looking at you and it's going to cause mayhem at some point when it gets up the momentum behind it. So, you know, pandemics and and, and the such like. So there's always those things. And permacrises was something that's been promoted. I'm not sure if the world economic forum is is sort of the the the, the progenitors of the term i think it was a maybe a, another sort of think tank organization but perma crises it's like all of these factors coming together to create com- a complex situation of chaos and potentially negative outcomes so you know you you've got you've got war you've got economic shifts you've got you know, cyber crime, you've got mental mm-hmm. health issues, you've got um, democracy being charged with misinformation, like, put it all in a mixing pot, and you've got something very interesting, right? I kind of feel that we've always been living in that world. It's just that today, uh, information travels so fast, and we're more connected on these platforms than ever, that it's been sort of amplified to to an nth degree. Mm-hmm. There was something that you mentioned in the book, which I thought was really interesting. And a lot of it is to do with climate change and climate change boosters. And being in front of a large audience, you're very careful in the data that you uh, present. Uh, You know, you you pull like U.S. Army. So sources that are bulletproof, they're beyond credible, because that's the only way that you can really uh, uh, counteract that that group think that happens in a large group. Could you tell us some stories about that? Yeah, I sure can. So this was this was in 2019 again, and I did a large conference to a group of about 800 farmers in Alberta. And it's always a, a rather salty crowd. I actually really love chatting to people in the agriculture industry. Um, I actually really love Al- Albertans and what they do. It's a very, very tough crowd as well. And farmers are a very tough crowd because it's a really tough situation. We, we, we owe everything to farming to farming at scale um for the growth of the world and we we continue to owe so much to them so big love and respect to them but you know i did this keynote and it was it was sort of the the it was the last keynote where i was very much like here's the truth 
you know, you got to accept this. <laughs> Welcome to the future. Thanks very much. And a, and a guy stood up at the end and was very negative about the keynote, saying that he couldn't believe half of the information in it and whatever. And and I realized that, you know, you couldn't you couldn't present information, throw it in and close the door to the conversation. You had to actually open it up. I actually ended up having a really good conversation with that chap and we we, we did. And um, about a week later, I was flying down to uh, New Orleans for my birthday with my partner and i bought a book at the airport called by rob hopkins called from what is to what if mm. and it changed changed everything and it was it was an invitation to be imaginative and curious and yeah. and but i just just in in my keynotes i i, I have these like these tr these trends with signals and scenarios and then i say yes but what if the world changed and people can't shut that down as an invitation yeah, and 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 they can all and and people can come uh, negatively at you and say, yeah, but like I don't believe this, I don't believe that, I don't think this is going to change, and that's going to change, and then I, then I sort of mobilize sort of my secret weapon, and I say, okay, but what if the world does change? And I say, if you you can take every single statement that you just said, just put the word yet at the end of it, and and rethink through everything, you know, replay everything. Because everything's going to change. And it's not necessarily going to change the way that I necessarily think. I speculate on which direction based on the signals that I see. But for you to think that change isn't coming, to change change your industry, or you know regulations or whatever aren't coming to make things more tricky, then that's that's not going to serve you in the long long term. So you know I, I've sort of I've got some battle scars. And from them, I've sort of learned some ways of framing, I think are really important, because you don't want to lose anyone in the room if you're trying to do some work. And, you know, I've been in I've been in some incredibly hostile rooms, people that are climate change deniers, um, which is happening a lot less, because it's becoming quite obvious that there's a challenge, uh, people that just don't think that their industry is going to change. And uh, yeah, and I share stories about companies that made terrible decisions based on the same kind of logic. Is that where fiction helps you? Because you actually write fiction as well, right? Yeah. So you know, the the work of, of futures uh, is is that of uh, find scanning for signals, the things that indicating the world are going to change, uh, the identification of trends, which is multiple signals coming together, the trends that come out of that, and the effects from that, and looking at scenarios. So in a future time maybe 2040 we see these people in these places and in, the, in these situations using these systems effective in affected in these positive and negative ways that's good scenario planning and that's what i do and i've written about in the book as well you start to really explore how things are chopping and changing but beyond that we can make things come alive by writing fiction. And I, I do, I, I write science fiction with my, with my clients. Some people call it design fiction as well. And what you do is you take the dynamics that you've worked out in scenarios, but you put names and faces to the people in the stories and their interpersonal socioeconomic dynamics, the culture, the community, the, all of those things. And then you, you start to play out all of the systems in sort of normal run of the mill, you know, daily, weekly, monthly activities, whether it's a, you're an organization or a family or a community and whatever. And what's important about stories is that they give you a feeling about what those futures could, could, could actually be. Now, once we can feel something and we can empathize with someone and we can imagine ourselves there because, you know, when, when, when people tell stories to us and they're, it's really good storytelling, we feel that we're there and we're, we're really having an emotional reaction to it. Then you can believe that it's a possible situation and you can start taking things seriously and you can start to identify the things that matter to you as an individual and you as an organization. And you can bring them back to strategic planning today and start the work of working out. It's like, okay, that might be 2040 and we're in 2023. What are the steps to get from here to there? And it's a really interesting uh, situation. Stories engage more than more than sort of dry presentations on scenarios and roadmaps, mm -hmm. trajectories. Um, the story makes it come alive. And I actually use it in my keynotes as well. I, I, I read stories, um, especially to very large audiences, because 
it just makes it all come alive. Yeah, exactly. But you don't shy away from dystopian futures either. Like it's not like you're painting like a, a sunny picture of the future. You you view it as important to have it, both elements of it, right? I mean, life life isn't necessarily convenient or easy. I actually say that futures are, are terribly inconvenient. I mean, it's <laughs> it's changing how we're going to be. Uh, we can make bad decisions today, and we can make good decisions today. Um, in in the book, I talk about you know what what. A, positive future is and what a dystopian future is positive is something that's built on uh, accessibility and equality and equity and humanity before technology and all the good stuff and uh, that's my definition and i'm sticking to it um the dystopian trajectory is kind of what we live in today uh, very few people own the majority of how the world operates and the money within it uh, we're sort of uh, we're, we're colonized and put into boxes and we work in certain ways we're, we're, we're trapped in that industrial complex and we continue to be so uh, you know buy buy these solutions ha live a happy life you know just you know you pay to play in this life let a lot more than you know just giving someone access and, and being connective in a community in a more creative artistic sense as well right so yeah we have to take it into considerations we're in constant hype cycles of politicians or or or, or leaders in government or leaders in business saying hey this is the future. This is what it's going to be. Trust us. Um, you know, pay your subscription, and we're going to deliver miracles. And you're stuck in a constant cycle that doesn't improve long-term outcomes. So, you know, fossil fuels is a great example of that. That happening for decades. You know, government and building new infrastructure and a whole bunch of different things is another example of that as well. But we can we need to put it in very clear context of you know what the outcomes are because there are always negative outcomes that someone's always going to win someone's always going to lose even though we really want everyone to win once we can understand that those dynamics we can start to disrupt the terrible thinking that happens and start to build businesses in a much better way unfortunately you know with market demand and shareholders and all these horrible things we're seeing a world where there's there's contractions and layoffs and horrible situations because people just want to make more money they don't actually care about the people that work for them or the progress of humanity right now in big tech we're seeing them like give up the idea of of creating a future that is actually open and and equity driven um to one that's just based on selling more ads to to try and sell you more widgets right right now, you've actually taken steps into shifting how executives are actually uh, educated, right? How do you envision that being important? And what's changing? And how are you taking steps to do that? Yeah, so so foresight and futures thinking, it's, it, it's been around for a long time. But it, it, it's funny, because there's not a lot of organizations that have really embraced it as a capability deep within their organizations. I mean, in, in facing our futures in, in the book, I sort of talk about where it came from, uh, and, and how it's gotten to here that you know, the, some of the great thinkers that I use as reference points are actually in there. I've, I've interviewed some of them as well. And, and what's really interesting is that there's studies that have come out uh, that, that say that you're going to be more profitable and you're going to have much higher growth, like 200% growth, uh, if, you've, if you're vigilant, if you are future prepared versus the companies that do not do that. You know, in fact, those, those are the companies that are on the path to obsolescence, right? So now executives are taking it very seriously. I'm, I'm going to be working with the Schulich School of Business in Canada, York University, so number one business school in Canada with their exec head program. Um, so we're going to be doing that later this year and working with people to really ignite futures thinking because all we need to do even if you take you know two or three of the, the the small you know methods that i talk about in my book even just that shift shift of from what is to what if to be curious to ask questions every single day to scan for signals it's going to make your strategic planning better it's going to give you a level of future preparedness that you didn't have before. It's going to have vigilance and it's going to make your strategic planning, your risk, uh, your risk scanning and uh, your overall brand and, and, and organizational vision so much more potent and, and, and stronger than it has been that, you know, it's, it's kind of a no brainer these days to actually step up and do this. That's excellent.
And people want you to be real. Like they want you to tell them the truth and be blunt. And that's what you bring to your keynotes and, yeah. and, and present, right? Does it take yeah. a certain type of personality? Like who who yeah. responds to that and who doesn't? So, you know, I always come from like, I come from the skateboarding punk rock background, you know, when I was a kid yeah. playing in bands, DJing. I celebrate the counterculture. I celebrate people that think differently. You know, I've neurodivergent um, thinker myself um it's really tough to connect with a lot of you know very sort of straight up uh entrepreneurs uh or executives within organizations i've been told time and time again that they hire me to come in and shake it up it, it's funny i i sort of uh quip that i now get hired for for the work that i used to get fired for, for doing <laughs> So, you know, in an ad agency, you don't go in to shake it up in, right. in a big four consultancy. Actually, you know, I, I worked for a company called Capgemini. We used to shake things up, but it was about mission critical systems and data and whatever. Advertising, oof. I actually got laid off from a, a very large advertising agency for speaking truth about the current situations. And um, yeah, that didn't go down so well. So, you know, I was put on ice and then I was fired four months later. And, um, you know, these are the same clients that are approaching me now. And that advertising agency is is pretty much obsolete at this point. So go figure. Yeah. There was one time I uh, you had posted something about a, a rock uh, performance in the middle of a forest. And, and I had asked you about it. You sent me the clip <laughs> and I'm like, I don't quite get this. <laughs> yeah. Could you explain yeah. that? Yeah. You How does know, art really yeah. subvert? Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to take yourself out of, you have to take yourself out of the city in the workplace in your home to somewhere different to have a different perspective. You know, the, the one example, I remember this Nola um, that I shared was uh, there's a festival in British Columbia in Canada uh, called Base Coast and it's in Merritt. It used to be in Squamish. 4,000 people in the, in the forest and they build these amazing stages and it's all, you know, eco-friendly and you know it's all it's all built on renewable energy these days and uh, people dj and get together and have a lot of fun in many different ways and talk about important subjects and and dance together you know it's like that that scene in the matrix where they're all celebrating <laughs> on the ground and in the cave right um that kind of thing i think we need more of in life and i've always I've always explored the counterculture. I think that people have forgotten that counterculture can exist. We kind of live in this horribly homogenized world of social media memes and TikTok dances, of articles and mindsets of which side are you on, and we've kind of forgotten what it means to to really get away and and sort of shirk these things off and say, okay, who am I and where do we go? And uh, and now we're sort of we have an opportunity to do that. I, I've always wanted to do retreats with executives. I was um, just going to go there. Like, yeah. This needs to be a retreat. <laughs> so I, I, I'm currently in the process of working out um, buying a property that will be used for retreats with executives. Uh -huh. um, and these, uh, I, I sort of joke, and this is an idea I've had for a number of years. It's a retreat. I, I want to call it advance right and it's uh it, it's a retreat where you advance <laughs> so it's kind <laughs> of you, in, in what you're doing is you're retreating from the normal life into a completely different context you yeah. know where there, there's no electronics and there's no wi-fi there's there, there, there's food and there's people and there's dynamics there's big world problems that we can discuss and we can come together and work this out and we might do that with the help of you know good whiskey or maybe some strong psychedelics <laughs> <laughs> i'm allowed to say that these days you are. right yeah, yeah, yeah i'm allowed yeah, to say yeah. that these days Honestly, but yeah but to be quite honest when i gave you the floor about attitude i did expect you to take it a little bit further than there because i'm like okay did, am i risking my clean rating <laughs> but <laughs> uh, it, it, it's all good i mean look we, we live in a world where we have to really ignite imagination we come yeah. back to that that beginning piece yeah. and uh I want to work with people that really want to take a chance, you know, Chatham house rules. Like we don't share anything that's said we get together. So yeah, that's, that, that, that's a little project. I've not really spoken a lot about to people. So uh, maybe call that an exclusive for your podcast. Ooh, I love exclusives. I did yeah. an exclusive the other day. I had Leslie M and her sister, Erica. Um, and it's the first interview they've ever done before. So like, this is my week of first. <laughs> well, there you go. It's all good. We're, we're here to push the boundaries, right? We are here to push the boundaries 
Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would really like to highlight? You know what? We're, 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 we're at a point in time where we need to really be careful about being trapped by ideas of recession, ideas of of contraction and protectionism of our own businesses. And we're at a point in time where we need to be open and creative and curious and connective, uh, where we don't think that there's competition in the world, there's just collaboration. I mean, that's what I think is really, really important. And even in market driven, you know, economics of, you know, the winners and losers, if you play this well, everyone's going to win, right? And obviously, there's going to be some losers, because they're the people that don't want to do futures work. So yeah, exactly. So how tired are you about the uh, chat GBT conversation set? <laughs> I did. I, so I did. I, 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 I did work in uh, artificial intelligence linguistics at university in the 90s. It was always going to be an area that is incredibly important. I've been following the large language model conversation for, for a number of years um, and, and some of the warnings behind that. We've kind of got this 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 world where every single client I work with is asking me for my opinion on this. Last year it was about metaverse, and so like <laughs> that, that, that 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 that's a dead dog at this point. Um, but like ChatGPT, artificial intelligence was always going to be disruptive. I like to think of the world as humans with technology, humans with the machine, so yeah. humans with artificial intelligence because it's the same as us picking up a flint and, and turning it into an axe all of those hundreds of thousands of years ago or the ability to create fire it's just a tool now we've got these tools that are owned by companies or significant investment by by large tech companies like microsoft um and open ai and whatever and, and everyone sort of suddenly releasing their models to the world because everyone thinks that this is just going to be the most you know, revolutionary thing. But what it does is it provides us with a new search engine, big deal, and it provides us with something that's highly homogenous and average. Um, I always think that we're heading towards uh, a, a place of you know, low quality, lazy work. And I think that that's what's going to happen with a lot of this if you don't use it properly. I tell clients this. If you have a question or you want to write an article or you want to be influenced by something that like chat GBT or these other platforms, ask the questions, explore, look at them in stark relief and realize that everything that they've just delivered you is everything that you need not be doing and go off on your own journey and define your own <laughs> vision in your own place. It's like, it, it's a relief. It's a mirror. It's not the deliverable i mean i've used it to um write articles on futures.com whatever as as the idea of like look at this third grade yeah. non-creative non-exciting thinking and we can go off and we can ignore what's already been said because that's all it's doing it's regurgitating what's already been said um it doesn't have imagination it doesn't solve problems it, sure it's complicated and complex but only in a way of combining things in new ways. And sure, it's going to look like it's 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 smart or maybe sentient, but truly it isn't. It's um, a very smart piece of kit, and I I love it. I love this kind of development, but I the don't like it. The exciting part is it gets yeah. people thinking about how things yeah. can be different, right? Yeah, but most people are lazy, mm -hmm. so 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 they they they're not here to think different. Most people are here. It's like marketers are like, oh yeah. I, you know, I don't want to write five blog posts this week. And it's like, you know what? I can spend half a day um, with some prompt engineering and I can write five outlines and, and reduce my work by three quarters. And it's good enough. I'm fed up of good enough. And uh, it's why I left advertising and worlds like that. Um, because in, in futures work, there's you, you literally can't ask GPT-4 to, to write any kind of future scenario. It can't do it. It absolutely can't. It can write some like some science fiction, but it's not. It's not very good in any way, shape, or form. My opinion about GPT four is that it's the beginning of a journey, and it's another tool. And everyone's hyped about it because everyone is bored of what they're doing at work, and they're suddenly looking for something exciting. I actually think that in the next six six to twelve months, there's going to be a little bit of a reckoning on on these platforms and an understanding of what they're really doing in the world and what people can use them for um, to spread even more misinformation and embed it in society even deeper. So, you know, 
buyer beware you know the intelligence communities are definitely definitely looking at this very very carefully and uh wondering you know how things are going to change at the same time um criminal enterprises organized crime and uh, foreign state actors are looking to basically seed in information that's gonna you know create create a poisoned well yeah it's shocking that some of the stuff that i've come across is just so shockingly wrong and it's just like that's worrisome yeah. And and so so I back in December, November, December, I used GPT three um and used chat GPT at that point to uh write um a fifteen hundred word uh, article on predictions across a number of different areas. And I, I specified it out. I was like, cool, cool, cool. And it was kind of very average. It was, it was okay. Some semblance of thought or semblance of reference. And uh I took the same prompt yesterday. I was like, what does this look like in GPT-4? Absolutely no different at all. <laughs> so so we're, we're, we're being sold something. And um, whilst like all of these people are hyped up out there pumping out content saying, look at this, it can do this, it can build this website from these, from this drawing, whatever. It's like, it, it, it's just generating more garbage. So, you know, we got to be careful, you know, uh, to, to use these things. But we're very, we're vulnerable and we're gullible um so you know it's my mission to wake people up and say hey uh maybe bear in mind that this is not good work and you know i fully respect that universities and, and schools are, are saying no when we're not accepting work from these places because it's obvious that it's garbage that's being pumped out i'd rather have a kid write something that was flawed and feels human than write, than have a kid just pump something out um memorize some content and play it back that is clearly this homogenous you know dead-eyed sort of view of you know creative thinking or yeah. you know the satisfaction i mean gpt4 talks about passing all of these exams it's because exams are fundamentally flawed you know okay. read this book memorize this book answer these questions it's fundamentally flawed it's a robotic process of course you know the world is isn't going to be a good place if people are like that people that i know that are amazing at exams are generally you know have been it's been generally proven that they're not actually good at creative problem solving because it's regurgitation, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, we see this with the collaborative articles on AI for uh, LinkedIn. Have you right. come across that? Were you invited to participate with those? No, no. I, I saw Reed Hoffman wrote an entire book uh, with, <laughs> on AI. And I sort of like downloaded it and looked through. And it's like, it's just another PR bump, you know? Yeah. Hey, look, look, look at this. It's cool. And I used it last year on futurist.com. Generated thousands and thousands of visits. Yeah. But um, only so I could hijack the conversation and talk about the implications of, of such things, right? So, uh, hey, you know, this is another this is another mini hype cycle. Um, you know, it's, it's now receding into Office 365 and other applications, <laughs> right? And just, right. Being, yeah. just being useful. And I'm cool with that. Yes. And, and hopefully it will uh, it will disappear from LinkedIn. And uh, what's going to come next? You know, Android robotics. I'm not sure. So we'll see. <laughs> hopefully it just doesn't sneak up on me like Roomba does. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah, Roomba. That's another deeper conversation right there. Oh, that's I hate Roomba. It, that's I, it, that, that, that's it. yeah, that's existential dread right there for many. Yeah, people. exactly. Well, this has been a lovely conversation. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if I will hold it up again, just this is my live and in person. Right. <laughs> Make sure that you read this book. It's a great book. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thanks so much, Nola. It's been a pleasure.